Um, hard drive. The red light is blinking. We're here. Okay, cool. All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to bring uh, a special guest to the interview series today. Somebody who uh, we were just talking off camera. We've only met one time, that one weekend in Alameda, right north of San Fran a little bit. But I, like you said, I feel like I know you really well because we've had so much interaction and communication. And um, I've been looking forward to getting you in front of my audience to share what you do because you do, you're just amazing. So I want to introduce my friend. Um, she is a, um, a fitness trainer, uh, a fitness uh, a coach, rock steady boxing coach. She works with people with Parkinson's all the time, and she just gets it as to what they need. And I'm really happy to introduce my special guest, Melissa Tafoya. Thank you so much. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm honored to be here. It's just, a, it, you've been a wonderful friend and such an inspiration. So I'm honored to, to talk today. <laughs> well, appreciate you joining us too, because, uh, you know, also, like we were talking off camera, we're a team. I, I just look at us all as, you know, I'm a guy. I started a thing. People show up. I'm so lucky anybody shows up. But, you know, I, I always say in the first morning of the first day of the workshop, I bet you anything, I walk out of here tomorrow night and I learn more than any of you. Because you may learn some stuff from me. I get all of you to learn from. Because we all have unique backgrounds, experience, knowledge, degrees, certifications, and uh, clients. We've learned, you know, all this experience. And same thing with people with Parkinson's. They're affected uniquely differently. Yeah. So we hear from them. You know, we mix it in. And, and having you at that workshop was the best, man. We talk about you all the time. That, that's such a fond memory to me because that was really, I think, a pivotal point for me. Um, I had been coaching Rocksteady Boxing for two and a half, three years. Prior to that, I had been doing uh, privates with people with Parkinson's and other folks with neurodegenerative diseases. But it was, you know, the idea that there are other like-minded people out there that are constantly trying to think outside the box, recognizing how, you know, people with Parkinson's, their symptoms are so different that it takes a village of, of, of support, right? It's not just one person in their pipeline. It takes a, a village, a network of people from doctors to um, so a, a solid support system. So when we met, you know, and you, you attract so many people, all walks of life, living with Parkinson's, caregivers, neurologists, movement disorder specialists, therapists, coaches, we all come together under the same umbrella together to work together. And like you said, everything that our experiences that are so different, we come together and we offer solutions and we're able to, in this organic way, um, create something bigger than ourselves and take something bigger away. And so that pivotal point for me was really feeling like, wow, there's a community outside of what I thought I knew in regards to say rock state boxing or, or our local Parkinson's community in Sacramento, where I'm from, you know, there's so many more people with the same energy and the excitement that, you know, we know that there will be a cure at some point, but until there is, how do we offer this quality of life, this hope? How do we get excited about the little things, you know, the, those little moments where change happens yeah. or, you know, and that happened in your workshop. You know, and so without going into like at two hours of what that was, you know, I could just gush on and on. It was really neat that when I found out about you and how you um, kind of attract your audiences, you ask not only for professionals to attend these workshops, but people with Parkinson's that I could bring some of my fight family with me. So being able to bring my assistant coach who had just started maybe six months in, was feel she was feeling really green. You know, it gave her a really great... Yeah place to, to take on it, some more um, education and, and share what she has also done. Um, but also, even most importantly to me, uh, one of my fighters and his caregiver. Yeah. His wife. And I remember them. It was so special. They, they've never forgotten yeah. it. We always talk about you. I'm so glad that they, they well, you know, I remember because you showed up with a team, basically. You had <laughs> four or five people on mm -hmm. total or something. I and, who was your assistant coach? What's her name? Stephanie Vitella. Yeah. Ah, I remember. I remember her. Yeah. Um, 
and her, her lineage is her uncle is a rock steady boxing coach in San Francisco. So oh. we, we met through my volunteerism through their program before I started ours. Oh, so I see. Again, there's always somehow in Parkinson's, I don't care how many thousands of miles away you are. We all know somebody who knows the next person and somehow we yeah. come around full circle. It, yeah, it's really interesting about that too. And I find it to be even more so that way, uh, continually more than I realized. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I remember uh, there was a gentleman who came with you. And I remember this one gentleman in particular, one a fighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, him. Mike Mitani, we call him Triple M. <laughs> <laughs> He's great, man. We he really had the spirit of fighting too. I mean, fighting back and and defying the odds, basically, you know, and and just not not succumbing to it, but overcoming it to the best of his ability. That's so cool. Oh, yeah. And he wrote, yeah. So you, for my next book. Yep. <laughs> so you, great stories, too. It's awesome. Um, so I want to go, I want to ask you, just kind of going back. I'm always curious about this. How did you start, like, how did you get involved working with the Parkinson's population? Well, you know, interrupt me at any time because it's kind of a, a bigger picture, bigger story. So I'll take little pieces of it. But I think it's important that I get more comfortable speaking about um, my background at actually growing up a little bit, because it really okay. what I think has fed this need to be able to serve others and folks that have neurodegenerative diseases. As I didn't know as a little kid, being much smaller, just the run of the litter, if you will, um, that there was more involved in my size and how I interpreted the world. I, kind of, I came from a huge family and was just terrified of big crowds and noise and a lot of things. And so I was labeled as just shy, you know, and wouldn't make eye contact and really wouldn't start a conversation. I'd wait for somebody else to talk to me. And so my first couple of years in school, it was just try to survive and, you know, not get pushed around or, you know, stepped on, if you will. And I was trying to find my voice. I felt misunderstood. I didn't know when to interject or, or speak up, you know. And I finally started to figure that out um, on the playground. I, I love tetherball and I started to have a voice through some power that I could exude. And that started to um, not only gain my confidence, but it was my way of speaking up, I guess. And so once I started to understand an unconventional way of, of communicating with people, I um, wanted to help others who had the same issue. If I saw kids on the playground that were getting picked on or wouldn't speak up when they needed something, I wanted to be there. And I just had this this attachment to always stick up for the underdog, always. And I, I didn't know how personal it was for me. It was just something I always wanted to do. And it kept revealing itself as I grew up, you know, as I went through different stages of school and then adulthood. But through that transition, you know, it didn't really, I didn't see where it fit in a profession until I got out into the real world. And my background was totally different than fitness. It was marketing and graphic design. So I was helping other people communicate for their businesses, but I yeah. wasn't, I was silent, you know, <laughs> and how much I like sticking up for others that just didn't work, you know? So I, in the meantime, found a lot of other activities. I found a lot of things that had community. I found things that involve martial arts, self-defense, um, workshops for, you know, meditation and yoga and, and, you know, thinking differently and calming the nervous system. And all of this was just so appealing, but I didn't really understand what I was going to do with that, except for I fantasized about doing those things and being with others more than my work at hand. <laughs> so sure. um, that, that was that was in the background. But my mother, who is a baby boomer, or was a baby boomer, um, we were very close. We were best friends. And she had really uh, a really bad back, several issues going on with her spinal column and needed surgery. And this was during the time that I was discovering where I was in life wasn't fitting. Okay. So she said, you know, Melissa, I know you've done a lot of physical activity. You've tried different things and you know the body pretty decently. And I, I need to go to the gym before the surgery and I need to work on my core. You know, I need to strengthen it. And I know a lot of people are familiar with that. So I said, sure, I know some basic things and I know um, I can I can help you and we'll have some fun together. And people thought I was a personal trainer and I wasn't. I was just there helping my mom and I got offered a job and my mom, you know, how uh, parents and their kids are parents will always say, Oh, you're great at that. And the kid's like, no, I'm not, whatever. Yes, and so sir. I'm thinking, you know, nah. then I'm offered this job and I go, Hmm, I love working with my mom, not just because she was my mom, but that it, the age group of knowing that a lot of times 
folks that are older are not listened to a lot of the times or taken seriously, given the opportunity to really reach their full potential, whatever it is, I, I could see that in the gym. I could see that some of the other trainers there wouldn't really look to her and say, hey, do you need some help? It would just be like, isn't that cute? She's doing her little workout, you know? And that was something I responded to. And I thought, you know, I get this. Let me let me see what, where this will go. You know, I'm certainly not satisfied in my other career. So started doing that. And I started really getting to know each individual. And again, like how I'm so attached to the underdog, if you will, I wanted yeah. to really deeply listen. And I wanted to hear what was going on. And so I started getting a lot of referrals of people that had unconventional issues. It awesome. wasn't that they wanted to lose 20 pounds. It wasn't that, you know, they had a yeah. wedding to go do. It was, you know, I have a, my doctor says I have an essential tremor, but I don't think it's just that all these other things are going uh, on. And yeah. That would lead me to reading more, you know, trying new certifications, corrective exercise, um, you know, special populations, digging deeper into my own things that I've been working with and um, realizing that, okay, I, I don't want to be the trainer that helps you for your new year's resolution. I want to be the trainer that helps you for your quality of life, no matter what. So the more people that yeah. were referred to me, the more they ended up having symptoms of Parkinson's or were diagnosed Parkinson's. And I started to unfold a new education oh. and knew that I needed to go back and get other certifications. And I became deeply intrigued with it. So yeah. that's really where it started. Um, it is really interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, my story is, I mean, it's similar, it's different, but it's similar in just that uh, I was a trainer and I got tired of doing just weight loss with people. Nothing wrong with it because I lost a lot of weight and, you know, there's a lot of value in that or there can be, right? So I was back at school for nutrition and um, my economics professor come up. He's like, you're a trainer. I see you at the gym. I have Parkinson's. Will you train me? Wow. Whoa. Yes. Wow. But I didn't know what to do. I mean, it's, that's a whole different story. This platform is you, but, but no, it intrigued me once I got into it and I started got direction mostly for, it's first for my son because he was working on his PhD back then. So uh, mm -hmm. it happened to be related to brain imaging and Parkinson's, not movement, but he directed me. And it's like, then all these, well, you know what I started? I started doing an interview series <laughs> because <laughs> I wanted to learn stuff. That's yeah. the whole reason I started it's completely self-indulgent, but, but it's also led to a lot of great friendships and opportunities and more than anything, just knowledge that I, not, I don't just take it in. Now I get to share it. So it's yeah. really cool. You know, I'm meeting you. You're one of those people. That's why we're talking because you have so much to offer, but you also have really big heart too. You know, you're looking out for the underdog. You connect with people so well that there's so much to that. And when you talk about people not being listened to, I, <laughs> We need our neurologists. I would say it in my book. I say it. We need the doctors. We need the medical community, but we need people to listen to us too. I mean, boy, you know, there's some pretty depressed, anxious, sad people out there feeling depressed and hopeless. And then you show them one ounce of hope that can make a big change. I agree. Change. Absolutely. It, it's funny because it all, I think, unreal unveils itself through happenstance, you know, just opening your heart to somebody else really yeah. tells you the next step of what you need to do. And for me, that's exactly what happened. The more I, I started working with folks with Parkinson's, the more I actually started to understand myself. And that wasn't done intentionally, but I started to understand some of the things that I was working on that were paralleling their journey. So as we would start to find out that, oh, you know, um, this isn't what I thought it was. I, I'm, I'm I feel like I'm degenerating. I'm going down the slippery slope and I can't get my life back. It's like this snowball effect, you know, how do you have this conversation with somebody who feels that way and, and kind of stop it in its tracks, you know? And so yeah. I, being able to relate, I think helps a lot. And one of the things that I discovered was boxing for a long time. I discovered that a lot of the issues I had as a child the issues of not being able to communicate, the, the severe empathy and passion to speak up for others, um, this obsession with it really led me to understand that I'm on the spectrum as far as the being autistic and not obviously on a higher, more functioning level, I, um, I can do this, but I realized that a lot of the issues that I have are very similar to the folks that are going down what they feel 
is the slippery slope of losing control. They're having almost this, um, how would I say it? Almost like a, a, an explosion or, a, or an outburst or a tantrum of, of, of not feeling they're in control of their lives. And I would feel like that every time I encountered something that didn't make sense or threw yeah. me off, your mind just, you know, explodes. So we would be able to have these conversations. Well, you know, um, are you having this reaction every time you're uncomfortable with something new that's presenting itself? Mm -hmm. You know, and they're like, what do you mean by that? I don't mean it has to be some earth rattling change, but it could be the fact that you're used to doing simple exercises that you had done, you know, at home with a video, some sit to stands or some, you know, breathing, laying down. And now today we're asking you to do some, some big steps and some big arm swings. And while that's not revolutionary, it may be just a big enough change for all of a sudden you to feel overwhelmed for you to feel uh, a sharp pain somewhere, um, something very uncomfortable is happening and stopping and you're thinking, I can't do this. There's no way, you know, backing it up to what's yeah. really happening. Does that make sense? I mean, totally. I don't really want it, but you know, and it's those conversations when you know, oh God, my mind does that. These are some of the coping skills I try. You know, you're not in, in interjecting your problem into them, but you're able to take the time that you take with yourself we, we're actually more similar than I realized as far as uh, some of my family says that I'm on the spectrum too. I, I actually think I am sometimes. Some of the OCD that I have. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, it's, it's, a, just, it's, a good, it's a good label is what I'm, yeah. I'm proud to say. I don't, yeah, I don't mind. I count things all the time. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be counted. I count <laughs> right. everything. I count telephone poles when I'm driving. I count the dotted lines on the road. I don't do it even focused. It just... I'm counting while I'm thinking of something else. And I feel like this actually helps me to learn better, think better, focus better. Yes. Can't explain it. And you know what? I don't want to change it. I also have, I was a drummer forever for a living before I got into this like 11 years ago as a trainer. And I also uh, think of drums all the time. I don't want to play them. I just think about them. So sometimes I'm counting to the drums or music or a song. And But you know what? It is like what you just said is I think really important uh, on many levels, one of them is that when you meet somebody who either is or was or tends to be a little bit introverted, uh, mm -hmm. has difficulty communicating, doesn't want to open up, feels guarded, feels they need to protect themselves and hold things in. Uh, I think being that way myself years ago, um, now I just, you know, I'm just an open book, but that took a long time to get there. Exactly. We, you know, being able to relate to that is, there's a lot of value in that, in being able to do a better job with people, doing a better mm -hmm. job helping them. Cause you know, that whole thing about relating. Mm -hmm. and as, a, as a personal trainer, actually one of my mentors who was up at Syracuse University, Ali Prettyman, who is just amazing. He, he said something last fall in a meeting that I had never even thought of. That's why they call us personal trainers. Yeah. We personalize everything. Like, I mean, the way he said it, though, it was like, of course, that's kind of a little bit what I thought. But the way he delivered it, yeah. it is personalized, but not just in the programming of the exercises. Right. It's every way. It's rela relating. It's, mm -hmm. and you're really good at that. You're just, I watched you at that workshop. Um. I have a lot of videos of that workshop, by the way. I should shoot oh. it over to you. <laughs> Thanks. That was so, just time. That really, uh, so many wonderful people. It is. It was, it, it was among the my favorites. <laughs> we had a really good crew there. So that's interesting how you got into this. So I'm, I'm curious to know um, a couple of things. It, for, I guess I'll just go with stream of consciousness. Sure. Now, like when I, like I say, when I go out, I deliver information or Zoom or whatever. I deliver concepts. I keep learning. I have new concepts to deliver next month in a workshop. But, but it's just me. I'm just one guy. And then I keep learning from people. So what I love is that uh, everyone has an approach to things. Like, what is your approach? In if you could generalize it, mm -hmm. and maybe you can't, but because it is personalized and individual. But generally speaking. What is your approach with people regarding the concepts you use to make them 
to help them improve the quality of life. Examples, you know, is it strength building, cardio, is it crossing the midline, is it cognitive training, is it joking around, is it what, like just what are some of the things that you're doing? Well, it really comes down to that initial meeting and basically having that, like the way you and I are having coffee, if you will, that's what I do when I first meet somebody, no matter whether they're entering our group for group exercise or if it's one-on-one, I want to know that person, not just the label of, you know, I have this and this is why I'm seeing you. I really want to dig deeper. That's the first thing. So I'll understand, you know, whether how they think, are they very intellectual in how they approach their life? Are they, you know, very book smart or are they very much, you know, off the cuff? They just are ready for anything. They want to try stuff organically. They, they uh, think through visually through pictures, you know, if I can start to understand the personality, then I can build the program for them. Yeah. So that's number one. And number two is, you know, any, any trainer needs to do an assessment and depending on why they're coming to you is, is the assessment you want to run them through to see their structure, what they're doing, and also their coachability. Are they understanding what you're asking? You know, just getting that communication and getting a feel from them. So to me, those are the skeletons to how I'm going to fill in their, their journey with me. You know, so that's the first thing. Everybody's clearly going to need some, to build some kind of strength. We're worried about bone density. That's across the board. We know the heart is so important. We want to work on cardio. We know high intensity training for people with Parkinson's. That's huge. But we also need to find the middle ground of what they respond to and see if it opens them up over time to try different things. Because my biggest thing, no matter what the person is coming to me for, could be Joe Blow on the street that is just looking for somebody with compassion. You know, they're, yeah, sure. they need that help. What, um, you know, what are they going to open their minds to? And are they cogni- cognition-wise going to be challenged with me? No matter who they are. I don't care if they're a neuroscientist, you know, or if they're somebody with Parkinson's, you know. Are they really going to be thinking as they're doing? Are they going to be problem solving and are they going to be equipped at some point to be able to take some of these tools and maybe not remember every detail, but it enhanced their quality of life, preventing them from falling, giving them the confidence to stand up tall and approach that person and shake their hand or maybe not right now, but in the future, shake hands again, you know, but it's all about, you know, the individual. So taking the time to get to know them and if they become, they become a bigger group, understanding that. They're compatible in the group, not because they think the same way, but because they're open to work together or they, they have an opportunity to give something of themselves that the other pe- people in the group don't have and that you can have a massage of a give and take. So there's a lot to put together. But to me, like you, there's so much learning that we get because we are inquiring and we're discovering and then we're having to research because oh this is something different you know this isn't something that is so textbook let's see what's going on maybe there's a workshop or a webinar that's talking about some of these new pieces and it's exhilarating you know it's like and yeah. it just goes. you brought up some real important points there i think the um something i need to do maybe think about differently that one of the first things you said is coachability are they coachable Mm-hmm. You know, I've heard of that. I've read about it. Now I wish I wrote about it in my book. I didn't. <laughs> but well, you, you know what? Books. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I'll put that in and uh, give you credit for it in this mm-hmm. one right, by where you submit. Because, you know, that's something I m- remember going through some courses years ago, way before I was in this business. Uh, one of the first things was, are you coachable? And if you weren't, they give you a refund and you could leave. You know, like 500 <laughs> people, I think two people said no. And then they tried to say, well, you know, whatever. But that that's actually a really good point. And I think that I'm going to read. So I love, love talking to you is I, I learn things. And I hope that people who are watching or listening, whatever platform you're on, think about this. No matter what industry you're in, if you're dealing with people and you're serving them, uh, if you're teaching them especially, mm-hmm. And let's talk about movement. You know, we have physical therapists, we got OTs, personal trainers, coaches, movement specialists. That relationship and finding out all the things that you said is so important. Understanding, empathy, but can you coach them? Mm -hmm. And that, it, it, I've had, um, I've had challenges in that area until I get to know somebody better. Exactly. 
It happens. I've had a couple of people that, you know, we've tried our darndest, but um, it just wasn't a good fit. And it's not personal, like you didn't give everything and they see that too, but that's just, just something that's not working. So I am always very honest in my approach to things and trying to do everything. You can't do everything. You do as much as you can, you know what your strengths are, but I think what's really important as a, as a person in this profession, any part of it, it could be a, from a doctor down to a fitness trainer is when you know you've given them your all and it's still not going in the direction that you know ethically it could please find somebody who you think might be a better fit. That is not a blow to your ego. It's not saying that you yeah. failed. You are actually doing a very good thing by saying, you know, we've gone this far. You've made great strides. I think I know this person, this person, or this person who might be able to do X, Y, and Z that you're asking for, you know, and sometimes that is the most magical thing because they hit it off. And then they think back to you, they thank you for that. You have a wonderful relationship moving forward as the person that got you started. And I don't mean it from an arrogant place. I mean it from, you know, there's always something we can do to help someone, but we know our limits sometimes. And we know that again, you can't do everything. It's just not possible, you know, yeah. you know, and, and I think you owe that honesty to others for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Took me a while to learn that, but you know, even recently I had a gentleman who wanted to train and he's an athlete. I wouldn't know the first thing to do anymore. And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't even have one meeting with him because I know I wouldn't have known what to ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, yeah. well, I, I know a really good trainer for you though, because, uh, you know, that would be a disservice. Right. Uh, even if it was somebody with Parkinson's, but their just their way of seeing things just wasn't yeah, you got to, going down different avenues, trying to get to the same thing, but you yeah. knew somebody else and, you know, maybe Allison and your team, you know, Oh, she, she has that kind of, um, of direction or she, she, that those are things that she really references a lot. You know, you might want to, it, you know, they, it, it, there's, it's something I think that shows not only integrity, but trust and the value that you have in both parties. And I think yeah. that's part of our job is referring. Yeah. It's a big deal. I'm glad you brought it up too, because it's it's an important thing. I think for some people uh, in this business, um, especially this year, for quite a few people, their income has been impacted negatively, yeah. significantly. So you know, it might be a tendency to want to take on somebody because you need to pay bills. But I've never been I, able to do that. I've, I've never. I can't, I can't do it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't do it either. I can't. I won't do it. If it doesn't feel right, or I know I can't. And there could be, I know I could, but I just don't want to with somebody. That doesn't happen often, but once in a while, I just feel like, mm, yeah. you know what? I think that it's not going to be worth it for either of us. I think in my head and then think, you know, I have somebody really good for you. <laughs> Here's your number or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> though i think we have a real responsibility that you know um because even if we were doing it for the money it will only last so long and then you've got to find somebody else so you know in this line of work for me all i can do is govern by my heart and my heart has has fed me tenfold and not by dollar signs but you know oh. I, I i will never regret giving more and getting less because i don't get less you know i'm i'm I can sleep at night. I'm oh, yeah. filled with love and, you know, everyone has a different why. So this is just because you're asking, I'm saying, I'm not saying everybody needs to do that. But I think when you find what fills your heart by serving others, you don't. I, you, don't you know, I agree a hundred percent with that. And it's one of the most important things in life, no matter what you're doing, you know, it's just, I, I remember, uh, well, we're on this subject, so I'll just say it real quick. You know, when I was towards the end of my days being a musician for a living, you know, there were, there were some great moments musically, uh, but I was actually doing a disservice to a, a couple bands I was with because I just wasn't into it. You know, we'd go and play these shows and like open up for like Spyro Gyra or, you know, I remember this, this one we did with 30,000 people. Or we're opening an act, and we've done that a few times. It's a total rush. You get a standing ovation, and there's thirty thousand, or, or there's three thousand, or there's five, or whatever. 
I'm not going to lie to you. That's a trip. <laughs> it lasts maybe just for that night and into the next day or two of thinking back about it. And then, you know, it's like eating too much sugar. Too many people <laughs> clapped and then you can't get it back and you crash. Yeah. And you know what? I remember, I can, can't even count how many times a person, let's say they regained the ability to do something as, let's say, simple, although simple doesn't always mean easy, mm -hmm. as simple as rolling over. I remember this one lady in Mexico, Angeles, 42 at the time, rolled over for the first time at the workshop in five years by herself, no assistance. She was in tears. I didn't know why until she made a comment later on Facebook on a post. And I, I didn't know. And you know what? That was that was infinitely more gratifying than all those people clapping. I don't care if I ever have people clapping again. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that she's she went from feeling hopeless and defeated. She's still I text I message with her almost every day because she'll be on the workshop in November that we're gonna do and she'll teach some stuff. She is unstoppable. <laughs> uh. She sent me a uh, video for doing ballet yesterday. It's oh beautiful. My gosh. I yeah, I just couldn't I couldn't believe what I saw. Yeah, so okay. you know that feeling, and you're you're totally in uh, in in line with you know, your your line of integrity is straight. Mm -hmm. I love that about you. You're doing so much great stuff. You know what I was wondering is uh, another question I have here before I go off too much on. Um, do you mind talking about? Let's say, do you have any most rewarding or uh, just gratifying experiences, one or two you'd like to share? Oh, man. I know, I it, it might be hard to pick, right? So many people with just, just various degrees, but um, early in my training career, I had the honor, and I'm still good friends with her on social media, working with someone who was paraplegic and had undergone a lot of trauma and abuse from previous caregivers and was untrusting. And um, she was an underdog without realizing it that I was standing up for. Before I even knew who she was, we would always work out together, not together, but work out at the same gym at the same time. She'd be doing her workout, I'd be doing mine um, when I was done with work. And it would be later, um, so it was quieter in the gym. We'd have the equipment we wanted. And I, we had this unspoken bond that it was like, we both were kind of introverts and we both w didn't want to have to confront people to get the, the machines or the um, dumbbells or, you know, whatever we needed and, and be able to work in peace. We just wanted to be in peace. So we'd see each other and kind of acknowledge each other and smile and, you know, get our work done. And um, one night she was doing her ritual on the cable machine and some guy came over and just started setting it up his way, just basically took it out of her hand. She's in this wheelchair and I just about lost my mind, you know, and that's I was okay with Without even really thinking clearly I get over there and politely you know she's in the middle of her workout you know please think about how you're engaging you know with others and that became the beginning of our relationship and she's like oh my god thank you she goes I wanted to punch him you know and I go you should have you know we just had a chuckle yeah. about it but it started a really beautiful relationship and I'm probably going to share my experiences of where they teach me I don't teach them they teach me and yeah. this has such a voice I didn't realize. I assumed she was more like how I used to be and head down, just get to what you want to do in a quiet space. No, she got there because it was accessible, but she has always been able to ask and figure out a way to get through life successfully. So she had, um, she was high on the ladder of her uh, position as a state worker for the Capitol. And she um, always knew, you know, that she needed to get stronger because her ultimate goal, and I had no idea, no idea talking to her that she loved ice hockey and she wanted to get into the special Olympics. And by God, she was, you know, in her late thirties, she didn't care. She was going to go for it and she was going to find a way. And she goes, I've been watching you and I really want to train with you. I don't, don't know if I have the budget. And I said, I just want to work with you. Like, let's, let's, yeah. make, you know, I just want, I don't want to lose this opportunity. You're an amazing yeah. woman. So long story short, we spent almost a year together and we did all of these unconventional movements. She, um, at the time I was really um, just, um, what's the word, captivated by TRX and the RIP trainer and like Pete Holman, because he's a yeah. therapist. I loved his work. I had been to some of his workshops, you know, and I had just gotten a RIP trainer when they had just come out, like they were being really marketed to all the 
corporate gyms. And I said, you know, Heidi, I think you'd really like this. Like you could do it at home. You're talking about having, um, you know, being strapped for time and, you know, you're tired of having those encounters like the one that we introduced ourselves in. And so, you know, this might be something to look at. Well, she said, yeah, I unfortunately, again, with my, my, um, my budget right now, I don't know that I can afford it. And she wasn't crying about it, a very proud woman. I said, well, why don't you borrow mine in the meantime? She goes, well, don't you train others with it? I go, yeah, but you know, we can get away with not using it for a month or two. You've got big goals here, girl. Like, let's, you know, let's get you going. She says, okay. So she said that, and I could hear the reluctance in her voice, but she, she took it. I didn't know what she was up to, Carl. So we'd be working out together and I think, okay, she's practicing using the rib trainer. She might have this for six months, whatever. She reached out to Pete Holman <laughs> and she goes, she tells him his, her story. And she says, I'm not looking for handouts, but I couldn't find on your website any coupons for this. And this is why I need it. These are my goals. And I don't want charity, but I'm just thinking it's the end of the year. You might have a special on these. And he was so captivated that he did two things. A, he shipped her one for free. I mean, there was no doubt about it. And then two, he put together the most meaningful PDF of images of his client, Paul Bradbury, who has MS, who is in a wheelchair. I know Paul. You know, okay. He's a friend of mine. He's in London area. I, I am in awe of that man. And I'm yeah, so he's amazing. thankful. So he yeah. put together a PDF of, you know, slide by slide of exercises that he and Paul do, and then guided us to his Facebook page to watch them work out together. She was on yeah. the biggest high, like you've ever imagined, right? So there's the six degree of separation again, right? <laughs> she That's just really cool. Out. And it just lit me up because she taught me something so important. You're not asking for charity, but you have a voice. And if you don't reach out for the things that you that are really important to you, look at what you can miss. So she moved to LA. She didn't get into the Special Olympics, but she changed her life. I mean, she yeah. it, it's amazing. You know, stories like that are so great. And and they also make me think about how when I have a bad moment or a bad few moments or day or whatever, uh how lucky I am and how I just need to shut up <laughs> right, me too. because there are people out there who are dealing with much worse uh, circumstances who can't, maybe can't move very well or, you know, paraplegic, any number of things. And they're fighting 10 times harder than I was or am at the time. And, you know, shut up, Carl, grow up and stop <laughs> complaining about. And so I generally am pretty cool with that stuff. But once in a while I get into a funk, but it's, I guess it's part of being human, but pfft. Those stories are the ones I'll think about. Um, so yeah, I know Paul. Not that it matters that I know him, but you know, it's funny because I'll tell you a story about Paul real quick. So hi, Paul. If you see this, uh, you're another person we have to talk with on this interview series. So this is about three years ago, uh, or maybe four. Four. It was four years ago in August, late August. I was in London teaching again and we'd communicated a lot we'd met before but this time he met me uh this is a day off i had i wasn't leaving london till like you know 10 o'clock at night or something like that so all day on a saturday like we met at mid late morning went to lunch then he in his wheelchair which is not electric it is hand propelled uh we walked miles and miles and miles around London and he wore me out. <laughs> I bet he did. He said, well, you remember this. I know you do. You know that I needed to take breaks and you were rolling <laughs> up hills and I was huffing and puffing and I was thinking I was in good shape. Now he is, he's an amazing guy. Yeah. And he's fun. He's funny. He's a trainer, you know, It'd be amazing to, to meet him yeah and he's an actor he was acting on a soap opera too it's just really yeah. really interesting multi-talented super nice guy he's been to a few workshops there i just say come on show up Small world. I, I love that he's a great guy so um i have one more question i want to ask um and that is you know there are a lot of people in the training business coaching business i know when i actually it's funny when i first got through my certification, the very first one, uh, NASM, 
which, you know, I think it's decent. Um, I didn't have a mentor or anything. I mean, I guess I did, but I didn't have any coaching for the, the exam or anything like that. So I, I read, you know, take the quiz, go and take the, the test at a testing center, pass the test. And then it came time to get in front of somebody. I didn't even know like how to do this. I, I was so afraid. And that's where I wish that, um, not to get into this, uh, I don't mean it in a negative way. I feel like an element of personal skills, assessment skills, or maybe even a hands-on mentorship where you're, okay. you have a mentor and you're, like in Europe, you have to do that. You can't be a trainer unless you go through, I think it's almost a year of, uh, with somebody before you're face-to-face -face alone with somebody. But for people who, and then other people are just great. You know, they get some really fly-by-night certification, but they're good because they're always out there learning, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've decided certifications don't matter as much as the person does and their level of uh, how much are they going to dig deep and learn. What my long-winded way of getting to this question is, with that in mind, what advice do you have for people who are in the business of coaching and training, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're experienced or not? What advice do you have? Gosh, I mean, well, obviously, it's you never stop learning. Not only is it about the certification, I'm like you, you know, there's so many certifications and there's so many even college degrees that you can get, but do you really work well with people? And are you serving, are you, have you found the niche that really matters to you, first of all, because it's not a paycheck. So, you know, finding the area of study, the area, the discipline that you want to keep learning needs to match what you're interested in instead of trying to be, um, what is it like a, a jack of all trades again? So that's, yeah. that, I think that's so important because when you do, then you obsess over it and you spend way more time on the people and the topic and, and the study than you ever would for a paid position. You're just always doing it. Like I know you are, we're always reading books. We're always reading articles. There's always a newsletter that's popping up. I get like 20 different things every day. I'm flagging stuff in the order yeah. that I want to read it. I'm watching videos. You know, I am trying to finish everything because there's everything I want to start and then go back to because there's just so much. And it's not in a, um, in a negative way. It's like, it's in a good way of being yeah. overwhelmed. Like there's so much more I need to know. It's finding yeah. that excitement of, oh my gosh, it's not, there's that much left to do because you're never done. Oh gosh. That's the whole point. You found something that you're going to constantly be growing in and enriched. And if you haven't, you've just found, well, I've got this one cert and this is all I got to do. You're not seeing the bigger picture and it's not going to go very far. So if you can see yourself Full, fully engulfing yourself into whatever it is. It could be working with children. It could be working with seniors. It could be weight loss, but it's your thing versus I've got 20 different clients that have 20 totally different things. How yeah. on earth are you really focused? I'm not saying you can only do one thing, but be honest, you know, about it. Isn't there somebody that could probably serve them a little better than you? And we yeah. need service to do that. So again, finding what you really care about to me is everything. And, and if you don't care about it, be honest with yourself and, 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 and give that person or give that to somebody who does, you know, it, it, it there's too much ego in fitness. There's too uh, much flexing yeah. if you will and selfies. And, you know, we can go on that whole tangent of it, but, you know, I finally looked at it as, um, you know, I'm just one other person connecting with another person and I've lived my life and I've educated myself to a point where I feel like I have something to offer, but it's on, it's an individual thing. I don't worry about, well, my resume looks like this next to yours because it's apples and oranges, depending on who you're trying to help, but know that you're equipped to do it. And if you're not equipped to do it, either the person that's working with you is willing to be you're, you're basically their intern, you know, and they know that you're learning with them and that's understood, or you hand them to somebody that is qualified to do it. I, that's, that's just, and I don't mean just by certifications, but by life experience yeah. by level of interest and how much you really care. 
And I know that from working at corporate gyms, there were people, if I decided I needed to leave and go to another location or, you know, some clients would want to transition and others wouldn't, I would make sure by God, there were certain people, nothing personal, but I would not put them with, you know, and there was because, you know, either because they didn't know, or there were people that had their doctorates that were doing this and I wouldn't give them to them because they didn't care. Yeah. Another number. Oh, let's get through it. You know, and that's, I don't care what's attached to your title. If you don't care about that person, you're not going to help them. I think that's probably the best advice you could give because I think it's the most important thing to start yeah. with. Um, how about for people with, let's say Parkinson's or, you know, I mean, you could say people in general too, but what advice, let's, let's just stick with the Parkinson's or let's say somebody with movement challenges who's looking to improve their movement quality of life. What advice do you have for them, Um, whether it's finding a trainer or or, or they're fine on their own and they're Mm -hmm. disciplined in doing stuff or they want to do stuff, but they're not getting to it. What what do you, what's your advice? My, the biggest concern I have, I see that in our, just our society is we get complacent with learning things that we're comfortable with and we stick with that. And yeah. we do the same stuff over and over again, and we shrink our brain, and we don't know how to learn again. And a lot of people are stuck by the time they get this diagnosis of having Parkinson's that they don't know how to learn something new. They and they can, they just don't know where to start. So their first thought is that looks easy. I'll do that. That doesn't look intimidating. And while there's always a stepping stone, that's great. Don't let that be your final destination. Like dip your toe into the water that looks comfortable because it's taking the first step and doing something about your health, your health and quality of life. But then after that, start to develop a hunger if you can to something that's curious to you. And my thing, I get real sappy about people with Parkinson's because they've become my family. Like I, I have learned so much and grown so much and continue to be in awe because I will stereotype right now. Most people with Parkinson's are exceptional people, not just because they've had some extraordinary life, but they have this will to dig deeper and do something beyond, right? They're, they, they have this opportunity to live life in the moment for now and not waste time. And many yeah. of them do and will find themselves doing things they never would have done had they not been diagnosed with this disease. Their life is well more balanced and cultured and full than our average American who's doing the things that are safe. So my suggestion is recognizing you have this potential. It may look ugly and scary in the beginning. Everybody is different. You're not given one outcome. So why close all the avenues of where this could go and and start to look at all the things you can do and all the avenues that have been opened up to you and how enriching you can have for your life if you if you demand more but it's it's again if it's with a person and a, a trainer if it's just yourself trying new things but this diagnosis doesn't sh- close doors on the contrary true it opens so many yeah i'm amazed i'm amazed at some of the people i've met i uh, there's a guy in poland christoph who i feel like we're really good friends even though we can't communicate together verbally it's all through google (laughs) translator but you know uh he sends me videos every day he sent one this morning uh he was climbing a tree you know and he's he's he has his days where he's he's really struggling um medication is a little bit a little bit of a shortage over there he's just enough right now to get by but um, but you know, he, he could, he's been told he could get disability, leave work. Doesn't have to, he goes to work. He, he sent me a thing I make, he'll send me stuff in English, just like I send him stuff in Polish, but you know, we both use Google translator, right? He's saying, I make my work, my exercise and the exercise is fine motor skills. Cause he's working, putting these things together. And he oh, says, yeah. I'll take my non-dominant hand and I'll start to get really coordinated with it. And, uh, I mean, you know, he looks at this as, uh, well, there's so many people who who have inspired me, just like, you know, they're doing what you say, and they, and they have 
they have this experience and they're living life more fully now than they even were before the diagnosis because they're fighting back. They have the spirit. It's just amazing. It it's is. So I, I am, I, I'm often told, and this is something that I, I want to figure out starting a movement about this, but I'm often told, especially by older gentlemen who are diagno recently diagnosed with Parkinson's, you know, I used to be somebody. You know, I used to, and they want to go over their credentials of everything they did in their life. And then now this is where I am. Or I didn't used to look like this. And I'm going, what are you talking about? I see such a capable person in front of me that could have anything they want, you know? So you had to retire early. You get an opportunity now to do something totally different that a lot of people are going to be, you know, grinding till the end of their days doing the same yeah. thing, right? And yeah. so the one person that comes to mind, we actually lost him to a heart attack recently. And it was oh, so geez. unexpected. He was one of these stories, Carl, that, and it was just about a month, month and a half ago when this happened. Oh. It was one of those stories that he touched every person in our Rocksteady Fight family. He's with oh. us for about three years. He told me when I first met him, I used to be somebody. He was a machinist. He built huge projects and used most incredible machinery. He started bringing in pictures to show us what he did. He wow. was very good at music and the bands that he participated in. He showed us all of this. You know, he ended up having a lot of dyskinesia and he would find himself out of control a lot of the time. And he would get really embarrassed and, and, and angry, you know, just so um, frustrated with his circumstance. And when people started to open up to him about, hey, that happens to me too. It's okay, you know, just take a deep breath, try it again. He would never give up, first of all. So in any group that he was in, he ended up having more off times that were obvious than a lot of the other people in the group. And he would take a stumble or he'd have to sit down or there would be some reason, some obstacle in his way. But he got to the point where he never got mad. He never complained. Instead, he would have the toughest time and make light of it and make other people laugh and get back in there. He would he, he went from driving to then riding a bike to then taking paratransit. To, you know, he would be so stubborn being in our parking lot because he couldn't get in his truck or he couldn't get on his bike because he was having an episode and he'd fall down and injure himself. And we wouldn't know it because we were inside cleaning up and I happen to look out. Do you need some help? No, I'm okay. We finally got to the point where, you know, he could let go of the ego and say, sure, I'll, I'll let you clean me up, you know, and tape you up and you know, take you home yeah. and stuff. And it was this personal time we had together, but he never gave up. He would always be the strongest guy in the class, hitting the hardest, blowing people away. And then for the, the tough persona that he gave, everybody who struggled or looked remotely fragile, he was the first one in line to give them his seat to make sure they got to his car, got to their car safely. And he would try all the unconventional stuff we would do. When we first started, it was trying to communicate the safe place. We would try, you know, like breathing techniques and, oh, I'm fine. I don't need that. It's like, JC, give it a, give it a chance. You know, in three years, he'd be the first to recommend it to somebody else. He'd be the first to sign up for, we do mindfulness meditation trainings with a teacher, a friend of ours. He'd be at everything. And he'd be the first to ask meaningful questions. And he just opened up. He allowed oh, us to know him. It was phenomenal. It, it I, I am so, to this day, so grateful to see that transformation in us. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Know, we, that is, that, what can I say about that? You know, that's just fantastic. I, to me, that's why we're doing this, is that we get an opportunity to really know people and to, and, and, and they give us more hope than maybe we even gave them. I don't know this, just to see this transformation. Exactly. He, he took on things that he went to concerts with us. You know, he went to, he went to vegetarian restaurants that he could have cared less about, but he was willing to try it because he knew it was something that was meaningful to somebody in the group. And the, exactly. the bonds that were grown because of it. I love it. Yes. I love that. Um, so, Unfortunately, we're at the end <laughs> because I think we need to do this again. Um, <laughs> no problem. We need to do it again. Um, I don't usually, uh, I wouldn't usually say this. I actually have a, another Zoom, but it's a family related thing. So, no problem. Um, but I, I think that we should do it again. So, uh, for anyone watching, of course, you know, this, when it goes up, it's going to be on forever. But 
Uh, right now we're in early October of 2020. So November 7th and 8th, it's on the way, it's coming. And Melissa's gonna be a guest presenter at the Parkinson's Regen Workshop. So uh, look for her there. I also wanna have you as a guest on a webinar too. So we'll figure that out. Oh, okay. oh yeah, totally. And uh, I just wanna say thank you so much for your time. Hang on with me after I hang up and say goodbye to everybody. But thank you so much for joining me, Melissa. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's been an honor. Yeah, we gotta do it again. And then um, thank you everybody for watching. I appreciate you tuning in and I hope that you learned. I know I learned a lot. I, I was especially thinking about the relate the relationship with people, empathy, coachability. That's something I need to think about and kind of reorganize and reassess in my mind. If you're in this business of helping people with movement, uh, that's some of the best advice. Well, we just heard it this past hour. We just heard some of the best stuff that you could possibly be doing. So uh, thank you again, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. And uh, have a fantastic day. Bye, guys. <laughs>